All right, let's do this. Coordination of metabolism. Learning objectives. So from this video, you should be able to compare hydrophobic and hydrophilic hormone signaling pathways, compare the three types of receptors that bind with hydrophilic hormones, Describe the signaling pathway that leads to the release of insulin from pancreatic beta cells. Uh, describe the signaling pathway that leads to the influx of glucose into liver. And then describe the signaling pathway that leads to the release of glucose from the liver cells. And this will get us um, into the three different kinds of receptors. So the first pathway will use a channel-linked receptor. It's one of the three. The second pathway uses an enzyme-linked receptor, and the third pathway uses a G-protein-linked receptor. That's why we're doing this, and so we're going to tie it all into um, how hormones regulate blood glucose levels. Okay, so we've been spending an enormous amount of time on all the metabolic pathways. Uh, really, we've kind of been focusing on the liver because the liver can do all the things. It has all of the pathways, and it's it's the major um, how do I say this? It's it's the major organ that is regulating what's in the blood because it can send you know fat out and it can bring fat in. It can send glucose out, and can it bring glucose in? It can bring lactate in. It can put ketone bodies out. It can bring glycerol in. It can really do all the things, and it basically can spit out all of the fuel sources that are needed by the other organs. So fatty acids could come from the liver. Ketone bodies can come from the liver. Glucose can come from the liver and feed the muscle. Glucose comes from the liver. Ketone body comes from the liver, feeds the brain. Fatty acids feed the heart, glucose feed the, feeds the heart, ketone body feeds the heart. That can all come from the liver. Glucose feeds um, adipose tissues, fatty acids feed adipose tissues. Again, all can come from the liver. And what regulates all of it are hormones. And hormones are small molecules or proteins that are secreted by a cell in one part of the body that move through the bloodstream to regulate the activity of cells in other parts of the body. And this is not going to be an extensive uh, talk about all the different hormones. I mean, there's an entire class, an entire discipline called endocrinology that has to do with all the hormones. This is just going to focus on different hormone signaling pathways, three ones in particular. All right, and before we get into the three different kinds of signaling pathways that we're going to talk about, I wanted to first talk about the two types of hormones. So there's two basic types of hormones, and they're classified based on their solubility. So if they're water-soluble, I would call them hydrophilic. Uh, they bind, so it's something like a peptide or an amine, um, if they're water-soluble, they don't enter the cell. They just bind to something on the outside of the cell, signal a second messenger, and that second messenger then does something. But the key with the water-soluble ones is they don't enter the cell. They bind to receptors... And those are just proteins um, in the membrane. Okay, and the reason they they don't the receptor doesn't let the hormone in, doesn't let the small molecule in, it just signals a cascade of response. And the reason that the hormone can't enter, other than the receptor won't let it in, is because it can't cross the lipid bilayer. Now the water insolubles or the hydrophobic hormones, these are things like steroids, thyroid hormones, think, you know, cortisol. Those are steroids, are lipids. So those do enter, they can cross the lipid bilayer and they can enter and they typically have some kind of receptor, REC is a receptor, they have some kind of receptor inside the cell 
and it ha will end up having to do something with transcription. Okay, so those are the two types of hormones classified based on their solubility, and their solubility really dictates where they can go in the cell. Um, again, the water-soluble ones, they do not enter. They will bind to a membrane-bound receptor. They will signal a whole signal cascade that involves a second messenger that goes can go to one of two places. The water-insoluble, the hydrophobics, do enter in, and they only impact transcription, which will then influence the amount of proteins that are made. And we're going to spend all of our time focused on um, these receptors over here, these the receptors that hydrophilic hormones bind to. So we're going to be looking at three kinds of uh, membrane-bound receptors. And those three kinds of receptors are listed here. So again, we're going to be looking at signal pathways of water-soluble hydrophilic hormones. And the three different categories are as followed. Channel-linked, enzyme-linked, and G-protein-linked. I'm just going to scoot this over so I can give you the big, big picture. And then we'll get right into it. Okay. So when we're going to be looking at channel-linked, we're going to be looking at glucose as the hormone signaler which is going to trigger the release of insulin. And the way that it does that is through a channel-linked receptor. And then we're going to look at insulin being the hormone. Binding to an enzyme-linked receptor and causing the uptake of glucose, which is going to decrease blood glucose concentration. And then third, in the third pathway, we'll look at glucagon as the hormone. And that is going to signal the release of glucose. And that uses a G protein linked receptor. So we're going to be sticking into the we're going to be sticking with the carbohydrate metabolism, um, and using that as our story to get through the three different kinds of receptors that water soluble or hydrophilic hormones bind to, and there are different kinds of signaling pathways that happen after the hormone is bound. All right, we're going to start. Um, with insulin being released from beta cells, pancreatic beta cells. What is insulin? Insulin is um, a really, really small pe peptide protein hormone. It's like right on the edge of being considered a protein, but it usually has um, multimeric forms, so they do can call it a protein. It can also be referred to as a peptide. I'll accept either. Anyways, because it's made out of amino acids, that means that it's hydrophilic or water that means water loving okay and insulin is made by one of a particularly special type of cell in the pancreas called the beta cell so we're going to start by looking at how insulin gets out so insulin is not yet the hormone it has to be released okay insulin is released from the pancreas in response to high blood glucose using uh, when glucose is using the channel linked receptor mechanism. All right, this image that's on the right is meant to be read top to bottom, and then once you get to the bottom, it goes left to right. Okay, glucose in this case right now is our hormone. And in order for this whole signal cascade to work, there must be a high concentration of glucose in the blood. This blue cell 
is a pancreatic beta cell. So it's storing insulin and glucose is going to be the signal to this beta cell that says insulin you need to come out because insulin needs to go to the other cells like the liver to say hey there's too much sugar in the blood pull it in and start doing something with it. All right step by step how does this work? I think I have enough space. I think I got enough space in these little boxes. Let's find out. Okay so glucose binds I'll just put a G for glucose. It binds to the GLUT2 receptor. And the GLUT2 receptor is the channel linked to receptor because it's going to be linked to a channel protein that is down here, the ATP gated potassium channel. Okay, glucose enters the cell. Nope. And once glucose enters, it undergoes all the catabolism that we have talked about, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, all the way through oxidative phosphorylation. And inside the cell, that means there's going to be an increased concentration of ATP. So glucose binds to the GLUT2 receptor, it enters, and goes through catabolism. which causes an increased intracellular ATP concentration. This increased ATP concentration, increased ATP, binds to the ATP-gated potassium channel and shuts it down. Binds to the ATP, I'll just put potassium channel, and shuts it down. And that causes a change, I'll put delta to mean change, a change in the membrane potential. And the reason why there's a change in membrane potential is because the potassium is not moving out. The potassium has a positive charge. If you don't have as many positive charges moving out, you change the charge of the membrane. That's the membrane potential. It's just the charge difference across the membrane. So when potassium can't move out, the membrane potential, the difference in charge across the membrane, has been altered. This signals calcium 2 plus to come in. So the change in membrane potential, I'm just going to put delta, I'm going to put psi, turns on the calcium voltage gated channel, I'll put this calcium 2 plus channel. So calcium 2 plus enters the cell. So the change in membrane potential turns on the voltage gated calcium channel. So calcium can now enter. And this causes an increased concentration of calcium in the cell, inside the um, pancreatic beta cell. The increased concentration of calcium inside the cell triggers the release of insulin. So it triggers, so insulin is stored in these little granules inside of the beta cell. And once there's enough calcium inside the cell, that's a signal that insulin can now leave the beta pancreatic cell. In this signal cascade, which is an example of channel-linked receptor, the channels, there's actually two channels here, 
there's this channel and there's this channel. The signal is technically the second messenger. is calcium two plus. The first messenger <laughs> is the hormone or the thing that started the whole thing. That's not an H. Glucose isn't, I mean, I'm using the word hormone here a little bit loosely in terms of glucose because this one does enter the cell. Um, but glucose is the, is the first messenger, is the first signal that triggers this whole cascade of response to release the insulin. with calcium two plus being the second messenger. Okay, so where are we at? Big picture. Again, this one, we're, we're gonna start with this image. We're gonna go, um, start on the top of the image. We're gonna go left to right, and we're gonna go to the bottom image and go right to left. So you eat a bunch of sugar, and that glucose is going to bind to the beta cells of the pancreas and cause a signal cascade to where insulin is released. And that signal cascade is facilitated through a channel linked receptor. Okay. Now we're gonna have insulin as the hormone going to the liver, and that is going to trigger the influx of glucose into the cell, um, which will then be turned into glycogen. So that's where we're going next, and this follows an enzyme-linked receptor pathway. Okay, so like I said, um, insulin, which like we saw before, is a, is, a, is a protein. It's hydrophilic, which means it's not going to enter the cell, but it's going to bind to a receptor, and the type of receptor it binds to is called enzyme-linked. Enzyme-linked receptors are um, transmembrane proteins with a receptor that's on the outside. Oh, sorry, there's a typo in here. A receptor facing the outside of the cell. We'd call this the extracellular space. Um, and the enzyme is on is in the cytosolic side. Specifically for insulin, insulin binds to what is called a tyrosine kinase receptor. And here's how that pathway starts. So this right here would be insulin, the signal molecule. When insulin is not bound, the tyrosine kinase is a dimer and the two dimeric pieces are not together. When insulin does bind, it causes the two dimers to come together. So it's binding on the outside of the cell. The dimer pieces come together and now the inside piece of the cell is the enzyme is now fully formed and can catalyze a reaction. And the reaction that it catalyzes is to phosphorylate a bunch of tyrosines on itself, hence tyrosine kinase. Kinases add phosphates. So a tyrosine kinase adds phosphates to tyrosines so insulin binds, the dimer comes together to form the functional um, enzyme part of the receptor, and then the receptor phosphorylates itself on its tyrosines, and now we're going to play a little game that I like to call pass the phosphate. You get a phosphate, you get a phosphate, you get a phosphate, you get a phosphate, you get a phosphate. It's a little bit complicated. Actually, it's a ton complicated. But the gist is we're going to pass a bunch of phosphates, and that's going to be propagating the signal um, to have the cell do, to have the cell respond to the insulin. The first, for the insulin response, the first protein that's going to get the phosphate is called IRS-1, um, and that stands for 
insulin receptor substrate. Okay, so we're just going to start passing a bunch of phosphates. And the result of passing these phosphates is going to be increased glycogen production because glucose is going to be coming into the cell. Remember, ins that's all the insulin signals. Insulin says uptake glucose and then use that glucose to make glycogen. And the reason it's doing that is because there's too much glucose in the bloodstream. All right, so IRS has gotten the phosphate from the tyrosine kinase. And again, this is just called pass the phosphate. I personally don't want you to memorize this whole series of um, steps, but I'm going to show them to you so that you have seen an example of a phos um, phosphorylation um, signaling cascade. Okay, so IRS passes um, and, and activates this enzyme called PI3K. Once PI3K is activated, it will catalyze the conversion of PIP2 to PIP3. PIP2 and PIP3, these are your second messengers in this. Um, PIP3, once PIP3 is made, then the PKB gets phosphorylated, and PKB has two functions. PKB keeps this enzyme inactivated, and if that enzyme is inactivated, then that means glycogen synthase can stay active. I oh, know, it's crazy. Sometimes a phosphate turns an enzyme on or upregulates it. Sometimes a phosphate downregulates it. You can tell which is which in this image. Let's see if I go back. Uh, by noticing whether the phosphate has a green circle around it or if the phosphate has a red circle around it. If the phosphate has a red circle around it, the phosphate has inactivated that particular um, protein. If it has a green circle, it has activated the protein. So when PKB is active, it keeps um, GSK3 inactive, which means GS, which is glycogen synthase, is on. And that whole signal cascade, all this is saying is, hey cell, it's time to start making glycogen. Why are you gonna start making glycogen? Well, because PKB also signals the internal storage of the GLUT4 receptors or the transporter that makes glucose, um, it signals these um, glucose transporters to move to the cell so that now there will be a ton of glucose transporters. I probably should have used a different color for that. Maybe I'll do blue. To move to the cell surface. And the more glucose transporters you have on the cell surface, the more glucose can enter. I like to think it's like, it's raining glucose all the way in. Um, so lots and lots of glucose can flood into the cell. And that glucose, some of it will go into catabolism and be, made, be used to make ATP. But a lot of it is going to go... To be made, to made into glycogen because glycogen, the glycogen enzymes, the glycogen pathway is on and ready to store excess glucose. Cool, huh? Again, this is all in response to insulin. Insulin binds to an enzyme-linked receptor, which activates the tyrosine kinase to to signal the start of the phosphorylation pattern. And this ph phosphorylation pattern is unique to the hormone signaling pathway. And the pathway in general overall says liver time, in this case we're looking at a liver cell, uptake glucose and start making the glycogen. 
I wanted to just, I don't know, show you PIP 2 and PIP 3 because I think a lot of times we think that the membrane lipids are just there for membrane support to help create the barrier between um, cellular compartments, but the membrane lipids can also play roles in signaling. And PIP2 and PIP3 are the second messengers in this particular pathway, and they are membrane lipids. So PIP2 is called phosphatidyl inositol. Inositol is a monosaccharide, 4,5-bis-bisphosphate. Um, and once IRS um, is phosphorylated by the tyrosine kinase, it can activate PI3K, which is the enzyme that catalyzes a conversion of PIP2 to PIP3. And once you have PIP3, then PK can move on and signal glycogen synthesis or glycogen synthase to be on. And it can signal the glucose transporters to move to the cell surface. Anyways, PIP2, PIP3. Cute little molecules, cute little names. All right, so where are we? So we're here with insulin having bound to um, a tyrosine kinase receptor on a liver cell, a hepatocyte. The phosphorylation cascade event occurs and a whole bunch of glucose goes into the liver and glycogen is being made. As this happens, blood glucose is going to drop, which is really, which is the purpose is to get the blood glucose levels to go down. This is going to have two effects. One, the low blood glucose is going to signal the release of a different hormone, glucagon, and these are going to come out of the alpha cells. And it's going to also mean there's not enough blood glucose to release any more insulin, so it's going to shut down that pathway. So we're going to now look at... We're going to skip the release of glucon, uh, glucagon from the alpha cells, and we're going to go to um, glucagon as the hormone binding to the liver, and the glucagon signal is the opposite of the insulin signal. And the glucagon signal, um, which is in response to low blood glucose, is going to say, hey body, we need some more sugar, so time to break down um, glycogen into glucose and release it so that our glucose, our blood glucose, will rise. And this pathway, where glucagon is the hormone, uses a the third, the third type of receptor, the G protein linked receptor. Alright, here we go. So glucagon is um, a small peptide of 29 amino acids, which means that it is also hydrophilic. And like I had mentioned earlier, uh, glucagon comes from the alpha cells of the pancreas. And it pops out of the alpha cells in response to lower blood glucose levels. And this usually happens um, in between meal times or during times of fasting. When your blood glucose drops, the other cells in your body start to get hungry for sugar, and glucagon comes out of the pancreas to go tell the liver to start making sugar so that it can feed the rest of the body, like your brain. Okay. All right, so like I said, glucagon is hydrophilic, which means it's a hormone that's not going to enter the cell but it's going to bind to a receptor, and that receptor is then going to signal a cascade of events. The type of receptor that glucagon binds to is a G-protein-linked receptor, and this is sort of like a general diagram. So the messenger here in our case is go to black. glucagon. This is the protein that it binds to, and then down here... This is the G protein. So when we say G 
protein linked, it's because this G protein is linked to this receptor. They are attached. All right. Events. Order of events. Before the hormone binds. Before glucagon. The alpha subunit of the G protein has GDP attached to it. After glucagon binds, GDP is kicked off The alpha subunit dissociates. And picks up a GTP. All right. One important distinction. The alpha subunit is not an enzyme. It's not catalyzing the conversion of GDP to GTP. It's just a molecule, it's just a protein that binds things and it kicks off GDP and binds to GTP. And see it's kind of, it's uh it's on its way to going to find its next target. So the alpha subunit, not an enzyme. It's actually called a GEF, a guanine exchange factor. It's just saying I'm gonna um, unbind GDP. And then I'm going to find a GTP and bind it. I'm not going to catalyze the conversion of the two. I'm just going to bind the different ones under different circumstances. Once the alpha subunit has dissociated from um, the receptor, it's going to go to, sorry, I don't mean to make this all shaky. It's going to go find its next target. It's going to go bind to, um, it's going to go bind to an amplifier protein. Okay, so here's more of the pathway. So the alpha subunit has the GTP attached to it because glucagon has bound. And the alpha subunit goes to an amplifier protein. In our case, it's adenylate cyclase. And once it's bound to the amplifier protein, In our pathway, it's adenylate cyclase, AC. It can either upregulate the amplifier or downregulate it. The glucagon uses a stimulatory G protein pathway, so we're going to upregulate, not inhibit, adenylate cyclase. And adenylate cyclase makes this really important intermediate called cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP is our second messenger. Who was the first messenger? Well, that was glucagon. Cyclic AMP is going to signal a phosphorylation cascade. You get a phosphate, you get a phosphate, you get a phosphate, you get a phosphate, you get a phosphate. This is what um, the reaction that uh, adenylate cyclase catalyzes. It takes an ATP and it cyclases part of it. And that is cyclic AMP. I just wanted you to see it. And that's our um, second messenger for this pathway is the cyclic AMP. Some of you also call this camp. I'll always call it cyclic AMP or CAMP. Okay, here's the overall pathway. Again, I don't want you to memorize every passing, 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 passing event. I want you to know the big picture. Glucagon has been released from the pancreas in response to low blood glucose. Triggers the release of glucagon. Glucagon is gonna go to the liver and its signal is going to be to increase 
the amount of conversion of glycogen to glucose 1-phosphate. Glucose 1-phosphate can be converted into glucose, and then that glucose can leave and go to feed other organs like the brain. That's the big picture. Glucagon signals that we need more glucose in the bloodstream, and that's what it's going to do. Glucagon binds to a G-protein-linked receptor. Once it binds, the alpha subunit kicks out GDP, and it binds to GTP. And then it goes on a little adventure. It travels down or across or through the membrane until it finds adenylate cyclase. In our case, when the alpha subunit binds to adenylate cyclase, it upregulates its activity so that cyclic AMP is made. And in this case, the cyclic AMP is this little diamond-shaped molecule. And then we're going to do activate this guy, activate this guy, activate this guy, pass, 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 pass these phosphates. Also is going to deactivate this GYS, which is also called glycogen synthase. So glycogen synthase is going to go down, regulated, which means no more making glycogen. And what is turned on instead is the conversion of glycogen into the, the glucose 1-phosphate, or we're going to start pulling off the monosaccharides off of glycogen to G1P. And G1P is converted to G, well, it's converted to G6P, and then it's converted into glucose. And then the glucose can um, exit out of the cell to start to restore or increase your blood glucose concentration. All right, I think this is, we're almost to the end here, so I'm gonna do the big picture again. So where did we start? We started with high blood glucose. Why do I keep using that um, green color? Let's go back to blue. High blood glucose bind, bound to the beta cells of the pancreas through and through a channel linked receptor signaled the release of insulin out of the pancreas and that insulin travels through the bloodstream until it gets to the liver and in the liver it attaches to a tyrosine kinase receptor which is an example of an enzyme linked. Receptor. And that triggered a whole cascade of phosphorylation events. And those phosphorylation events caused the glucose to come into the cell and glycogen synthesis to be initiated, which in turn causes the blood glucose concentration to drop which is fine until it gets too low. Too low, low blood glucose is going to trigger, I guess I'll switch to, maybe I'll go to pink for this one. Um, too low blood glucose is going to trigger the release of glucagon from the alpha cells. Glucagon will also travel to the liver and it binds to the liver using a G protein linked receptor. And that G protein linked receptor is going to trigger a signal of um, events that result in glycogen to be broken down into glucose. And then glucose is then released back into the bloodstream and the blood glucose levels rise. And we go around and around and around again. And basically the liver here is making sure that the right amount of glucose is in the bloodstream at all times so that your brain 
doesn't die and go into a comatose state. Although it would probably go comatose before it dies. I should have said that in the opposite, um, in the opposite way. All of these uh, signals that we looked at today are all hydrophilic. They're all water soluble. They bind to receptors on the outside of the cell and trigger a signal of cascade events on the inside of the cell. And that is my story for the day. I will see you when I see you.